Good, good morning and, and good day to all of you. Uh, Francis and I will, will take turns in uh, presenting uh, and here the, the, the deck is, is coming up. Um, I'll turn immediately to, uh, to Francis, who's going to be presenting the first part. Good morning and, and good day to all of you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So, so, uh, so I'll just Sorry, start. With... We are live on YouTube. So YouTube was a let, has let us uh, start the live. So uh, you could just introduce yourself just once again so that people live on YouTube can see it. Thank you so okay. much. Good, uh, good day to everybody. My name is Basil Van Hav, and I'm here today with, uh, with uh, my co-chair, Francis. We, we have a short presentation to, uh, to introduce the subject. We're mostly interested in the question and answer. So Francis, why don't you start and, uh, and then uh, I'll pick it over after slide nine. So over to you, Francis. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, co-chair. And um, again, good morning, everyone. It is uh, good evening almost now on my side here. It's actually good evening. It is uh, coming to six almost any time from now, like that, about 35 or about 35 to six. So um, I had um, a lot of encouraging remarks about the co-chairs. We've traveled, yes, and I, I think I could also say that I've never traveled like I did this time around when I, you know, given this task of being a co-chair. And um, again, to say that I think COVID has really changed the landscape in ways that we, global landscape in ways that we didn't expect. Meetings like this, we couldn't have thought would happen uh, some time back, but it's now the new normal, as they say. So is 2020 now looked at as having lost to being the super year for biodiversity? I think my co-chair and I would think that that is that it is still true that this is still actually the year of biodiversity, and uh, most of you will be seeing that now nature can actually be put back to recovery. If you just see around you what is happening due to the lockdown that has taken place globally, and you see the recovery that is taking place, it clearly shows that actually we can put nature back to recovery. So I think even then we are already learning the lessons before we we, we can come up with a certain text at all uh, in, 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 the, in the framework itself. So having said that, um, let's go to the next slide. So this is basically it. Um, and most of you have heard about this, that we are really losing a lot now globally. There is a lot of loss of species, but it is believed this is the sixth um, mass global extinction. And um, that has implications as well. It has on health. It has on food and water security. It has on the economy. You've just had the executive secretary talking about sustainable development. How else are we going to achieve that without biodiversity? And also you have had her reference to disaster than, uh, disasters and pandemics. This is going to be the reality if we become, or the global community does not really uh, protect nature, disasters and pandemics will be much more harsh when they happen. And certainly we shall be seeing more of that. And biodiversity has a very big role it plays in this. So going back to nature, respecting nature, using nature more sustainably, humanity's future is more guaranteed here. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, some technical, okay. So here is just to tell us a little bit about the species loss that we are talking about, some scientific information that is available now. And when people say we've lost 1 million species, they're at risk of being, um, you know, going, going extinct, maybe in the next 30 years or so. Now, some people may think that is, that is just species getting lost. Human beings are going to be here, but it's very unlikely that we shall be here as well with all this loss of species around us. Over 90% of marine fish stocks declining you know that what that will mean in, in terms of livelihoods, in terms of even uh, sustainable development itself. There are some countries, of course, that the fish industry is so important. And even the revenue of the government would decline. Lost since 1970. And look at that, 80% of insect biomass lost in the last two decades. 
when you think about insects getting lost, is it just insects? People shouldn't look at this just as a, a small issue because these are pollinators. This is just about our food systems. Our food security is gradually getting compromised with this kind of losses around us. Then 46% of the forest fell by human activities. Actually, I could even tell you that what COVID has shown us is that the world can go back to those days that man was not there yet. If, if, if you look at it, if man disappeared from this planet, everything would be okay. Seems uh, human beings are such a terrible creature on this planet. When it comes to nature, they don't want to use nature carefully and therefore nature is really bearing all the pressure that it can to sustain humanity. So we need to be much more careful in the coming years about nature. Let's go to the next slide. Yes, so what do we hear from the economists? What do they tell us about loss of biodiversity? You know, there are risks to business. They will tell you, sometimes they'll tell you it is security, they'll tell you it is peace, but it is now loss of biodiversity is among the top five risks to business. And this is the, where the business community may want to take a leap from as there is lots of biodiversity around business could as well shrink. Already I know back in Uganda here how the tourism industry is suffering because of COVID. You know, and so if that could if take it that for example biodiversity is lost, then that means even the tourism industry would disappear. So there's a lot at stake from the business angle. Then inaction versus the cost of actually taking action. Now, then the cost keeps piling. It will mean that there's a lot that we need to spend. There's a lot of investment needed. But if we take action now, we reduce on that. Of course, then there is massive amount of resources available in subsidies. And you'll be hearing us talking about this more maybe when we next meet about the framework itself. How do we maybe do repurposing of this, some of these uh, um, already locked up subsidies in a, so that it benefits biodiversity. Let's go to the next slide. So that is fortunately the lack which is there. 196 countries who are parties to the CBD are working together to have the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. I had Christian, Christian getting a little bit worried about the framework. I can tell you that the framework will be there. We are working very tirelessly since Rome. We've continued to work and it will be there. Even if it is next year or any other time, it will be there, but we want to, it to be there as soon as possible. So this is, I think the action that was there in Rome. So let's go to the next slide. So when you look at this then, the framework itself, as you will see from decision 1434, is that there are guiding principles, general responsive, transformative, comprehensive, catalytic, visible, knowledge-based, transparent, efficient, results-oriented, iterative, and flexible. So those are the 13 principles to guide the development of this framework. So being open and transparent and inclusive and having the science base is one of those, of course, that we are very much pursuing. And as you will know that this framework has got two co-chairs that were designated, that is Brazil and I, and it has got the open ended working group through which the negotiations are happening. So the framework is for all, really. And you keep hearing this including you, the youth. I've said severally that person I was a youth. Many years back, I didn't even know I would be here where you see me today. But also now I can see that we are supposed to be handing over to the youth. So as you've heard the executive secretary saying, really you, the youth, you are the future. And for us, we're even glad that some of you are already very active in this process. So when you will next take on this mantle, we believe that the framework itself and by the bus has got disciples out there who are young, who are vibrant, and who can help to, to, to push the cause. 
So let's go to the next slide. I hope this is slide the number, I can't see it very well here, co-chair. Um, this is it? Seven. Seven, Seven. okay. Good, All right. So process, where are we? And I think this will talk to what Christian was saying. Are we losing it? Yeah, it's superior for biodiversity getting lost. Christian, just be faith, have faith. We are on track. I know <laughs> it's, it's, some messages circulating on WhatsApp here in Uganda when somebody is asked about his CV, which is missing 2019, sorry, 2020 on it, and is asked, so why is 2020 not? They said, you know, I didn't do anything other than wash my hands. So I couldn't really put anything there. Just washing my hands was not a very serious stuff. So 2020 has, but for us, we, do, we, we did some work in, in, in February, part of March. So where are we with the process? The three stages, regional consultation, the thematic uh, workshops that took place, and then the negotiations. Most of this, some of you may be aware, we had the first meeting of, before the first meeting of the working group, the regional consultation, five of them were consulted and completed successfully between January and March this year. Then, so last year, then we had the first meeting of the open ended working group that took place in August. And after that, we were asked as co-chairs to prepare something, some zero draft, preliminary zero draft and present at Substar. 23rd and also the, the working group on Article 8J meetings. And we did that, that was in November um, last year. But also following from that, we've had a number of thematic consultations that has taken place on restoration and marine resource mobilization, accountability and uh, capacity building. This one is took place just at the margins of the second meeting of the working group in Rome in February this year. And then after that, we are now moving into developing draft one zero. But before that, we might have actually other meetings planned, if possible, we are thinking that should happen. Of course, the dates keep changing because of COVID. Um, we are going to have this, the 24th meeting of SABSTA and then the third meeting of SBI. But before that, we should have, um, I think now we are changing the strategy. We are going to have the synergies meeting might just happen just before SAPSA. And then the sustainable use is now going to happen more online. We might pursue the online approach to that. Now, what will happen at SAPSA is that we really want SAPSA to mainly focus on indicators, to focus on baselines and other scientific technical issues that we need SAPSA to, to really uh, give us further guidance on. The text, you might see some changes in the text of the goals of the targets, but we wouldn't want that negotiation of SAPSA should occur. Then after that, we should then have, after hearing, getting some feedback, we should prepare the draft one zero. And we think maybe we shall have about six weeks to do that and then post it six weeks uh, before the third meeting of the open and working group. This, again, the date is now flexible. It is not yet confirmed now. And then after the third meeting of the Open and working group, we should then have a uh, COP 15, still in China, of course. So this is it. I will do summarize for you where we are, where we have been, and where we are intending to go. The next slide, and then I can think the coach will come on. So I think some of this I've already explained in the previous slide, that we are going to present to Substar a table, which will have goals and targets, it will have elements of components, the monitoring elements, the indicators, and then also the glossary, info, glossary part of that uh, document that will be submitted, issues on baseline, and then the linkages to uh, SDGs. We have heard a lot about this. So this could be up for peer review. Again, the date is there, uh, 6th June, 8th June, up around uh, 22nd June. And then we hope we can, after that, now work on another document, um, the, the one that will be, of course, be made available uh, now for, for the meeting of Substa. 
after first year, year getting some uh, you know views on uh, during the peer review so then you will have again that document that will be posted um, after that you have the table of uh, still going to be a revised table which will have the glossary uh, information as well the baseline the linkages uh, to SDGs and then we also think SABSA should tell us these aspects of numerical values on the targets that's kept coming over and over again. And then we hope that um, in between, somewhere in August, if we were possible, we could have um, some um, further webinar on accountability, on resource mobilization as well. So these are all things which are planned, but we hope we are going to be able to, to do that. And I think the other timelines are already spoken about them. So the very last, then my coach, I will come on the very last slide, I think. Yes. So I think from what, to borrow what Christian was saying, having moved, Basil and I, really have the movement I've never made in my life up to now, all the five regions, most of the time, uh, Three weeks we are off from home, two weeks you're off from home. So around the world, we had the regional consultations and we have also participated in those thematic consultations, informal meetings, conferences. Then the formal, of course, open energy group meetings, two of them to date. But things have come out from there. And one of the, which I'm seeing, or we have seen clearly is your role as youth, that you are a very, very important factor. You have a very important role to play in this process, both in terms of during the time we're negotiating the framework itself, but also when it comes to implementation. A framework of 30 years, I can tell you, requires young people. Most of us, we shall be tired and in our verandas, I suppose, <laughs> not far from now. Then the executive side made reference to this intergenerational equity as being an essential component of the post-2020 global diversity framework. We have to coexist, people have to coexist. We have to play our different roles with the different ages, different age brackets that are there. We only one planet is for us. And then the link to climate change, as well as, of course, the link to SDGs. We have tried our best now as we speak. And I think when eventually you see the next draft of post-2020, you could see some changes. We are really working very hard to make sure we respond to what came out of them. So thank you so much. I think I'll hand over to my coach, Abbas. Thank you, Francis. <laughs> if we can move to slide number 10. Okay, so you've seen, you've seen that model probably a few times. That's, that's the evolution of uh, the high level model. And, I, and I'll go over the next few slides in, in giving you some details on, on what we're, we're thinking. So uh, vision is there. Uh, what we're working on is, is how are we gonna be uh, defining the targets that are in the, in the green box. I mean, in order to ensure that that vision is, uh, is, is reached, then uh, we, we need to define what's, how do we define that vision in terms of tangible aspect. And that's where the goals come in. We received some really good comments in Rome, and, and uh, the idea now is to define a 2050 vision that is accompanied with some uh, 2030 uh, milestone. So if we can move to the next slide. Oh, before we go there, well, that's okay. I can speak to this one here. So you can go to 11. Sorry, I'm messing with uh, uh, the... So you still have the vision, the goals are the same. Uh, the threats you see there that we're going to be using still <coughs> the the five direct drivers of of uh, biodiversity loss as this as a uh, as a uh, enunciated by by the best but we heard very clearly that uh, people wanted to see something around species so um, that's something we're considering very carefully on the the needs what uh, what we heard very clearly is that people wanted us to, uh, to be uh, broader in a sense and also clearer. So that notion of sustainable use of species will still be there. The notion of uh, sustainable activities on the landscape will also still be there. Probably you will see kind of a broader definition 
of um, environmental goods and services or, or ecosystem services. Uh, first draft was focusing on water and health, but that's that's still going to be there. And and health, if anything, is is a stronger statement. Sharing of benefits uh, definitely uh, uh, will continue to be there. Uh, some evolution you will see on the tools and solution. Uh, incentive and economic will remain a very strong uh, element. Law regulation and possible and policies will also be there, together with the to expression of mainstreaming. Biosafety will will st still be there. I think we we're evolving and are thinking about behavior change, sustainable production, consumption, and um, and uh, delivery chain. And then you will see some some member some uh, some new language there. And um, also lots of work being done on enabling conditions, means of implementation and responsibility and transparencies. I think there is good, uh, there, we're really looking forward to the contribution of SBI, but also uh, looking forward to how parties want to discuss that. Do they want to see it at COP15 or do they want to have that discussing, discussed together with the rest at open-ended working group three? So moving to the next slide. You see here the uh, the targets as expressed in the uh, in draft zero, uh, as indicated the earlier. Uh, there was uh, some uh, some work being done on them, but but essentially you're talking about an evolution, not a revolution. Uh, we heard very clearly some message about the need to uh, work closely, a simpler system of targets around 2050, and I think we get something to put on the table. Uh, very soon that that uh, you will see is is trying to answer to what we heard. Um, you will see also uh, some evolution in the language around the threats, and we're really looking forward to the SEPSTA discussion, both in terms of the uh, indicators and also direction on what is possible in terms of baselines and also links to the SDGs. So all those pieces are working together, and I think a lot of the work we're doing with Jyoti and colleagues from the Secretariat, but also with the chair of uh, SEPSTA and SBI, is to ensure we have a seamless process that works for parties and for you. So this is not just about following the rules and making sure every T is crossed and I is dot. This is about having a meaningful conversation that enable to have the good negotiation. Use and, and uh, health and cultures and those aspects will continue to, uh, to be there. Uh, so no no change there. Uh, you will you will see uh, the uh, the same kind of of, uh, of approach. So I don't think I need to say a lot more there. Uh, you will see an, imp an improved and increased place for resource mobilization. That's a message that came out loud and clear. So and that's a very appropriate one. So so expect to see that as well. Next slide. What's your voice? And and uh, so so and and what's your role into this? So, what is a vision? The vision is 2050, and then and then Francis says that in 2050 we'll be retired. Uh, I definitely think our, our role in the conservation agenda will be different when I get to 2050, and your role will be different. So, um, what's your role in terms of building uh, the new world? There is lots of talk about building back better after the COVID or build, building back new system. And, and you're the one that will be uh, using those system and those economy. So uh, basically, I think uh, you're an essential part of that and, and, and we have to work with you. Uh, so uh, very, very pleased to be part of this event today. Um, the the framework is be developed for 2050. There will be check-in every 10 years. We're working on the uh, system for transparency and responsibility, and there may be some global stock take in within the 10-year period. So it is both a short-term uh, process but also a long-term one. Uh, biodiversity is borderless. Uh, I don't know any culture, any groups, any nation that does not has a link with uh, biodiversity. It is a social cultural link. We're talking about equality and cross generational equalities, an important aspect of that. Um, I was talking with uh, the Nordic Youth Council uh, a few weeks ago, and we talked about the, 
the no the notion of of how generation work together. Uh, and one thing I noted to them is is you the youth are being uh, uh, supporting the plant or the, the most of the effort during the confinement. It is not fun to be sitting in an apartment in a university town and not being able to go out, etc. And you're doing that for people like me and people older than me because we're the one that are most at risk, not you. You're doing it for us. So, you know, the, there is that kind of general chain of things we do for each other and how, how all of that is working together and, and how this, I think the crisis is bringing to the world attention that uh, we're all in this together and, and uh, the things what goes one way go the other way as well. Nature use and health, connecting nature is essential to sustainable development. We've, uh, we've, we're very happy to hear uh, um, Elizabeth Marema talking about the numbers. Uh, in my country here, if you look at uh, where the use are, they're mainly in indigenous and local uh, communities. You know, there is a massive amount of use coming with that background and they have a very good connection to health. So we have to, to work with them. The concept of one health and how we relate nature, health, human health, and ecosystem resilience. And there is many different definitions floating around now, uh, eco health, one health, unified health. And, and we're going to have to work together in terms of better understanding how all that is working together. Next slide. So what can you do? Uh, you, you should join, and you are joining, in, in both at the global level, at your national and regional level. I think uh, they are all important. Do not hesitate to contact Francis and I. Very happy to be active at the global level, but equally happy to uh, join regional groups if, uh, if we can be helpful. And, and I encourage you to, to join and be active. Collaborate. I think as much as you can bring a unified voice, with strong intervention at the international, national and regional meeting. That's very important. So uh, working together as you are doing today is something you, you can do. Connect with like-minded country. It is very important to understand that at this point in the process, Francis and I cannot uh, entertain a suggestion sent directly to us. They have to come through subsidized BI and parties. So that's a very important uh, point to, to keep in mind. Organization, be prepared, listen to uh, the document and review them. Um, identify the organization and, 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 and be them private or public that wanna uh, support you and work with you. I think there is many opportunities. It's gonna be a tougher uh, proposal as uh, we are moving forward and we feel that there is gonna be uh, some difficulties, but uh, I think you get a very strong message to send and one that uh, a number of organizations will listen to learn from others. I think I learn every day. I learn, uh, I learn listening to you. I learn through that process. I, I don't think I will ever stop to learn. And, and, and I'm just like you. I think every day in our life, we got to look for the tidbits and, and see how we learn. The way we learn change over time. That's a detail. Write letter, sign petition, engage politically. Those are things you can do that I cannot do. So that's very important. And then, and then participate, engage yourself. You have to be part of that action. Uh, when you get to 2050, you have to look back and say, I was part of that. So that's a very important part of it. Next slide, please. So uh, how do we communicate? And, and, and clearly, uh, you know, you, you have the uh, Friday for Future, a very powerful movement where people were gathering and, and can get on news. And, and that's something from the past a little bit. You're gonna have to find new ways to do that. And you can do that very effectively uh, from electronic means. Um, there is ways, it, it's about adapting and learning. And, and, and if you cannot do it, uh, nobody will be able to do it. Um, your impact will be, will be stronger than ever. Uh, you'll have to, to engage with friends and family, all generation. Um, volunteer work is, is highly uh, uh, emblematic. Uh, you, for example, in North America, there is that action of planting milkweed that provide habitat for a, a butterfly that migrate across the, the continent. And, and that's, that's, those are kind of very small things we can do uh, and you can do within, uh, you know, the, during the period of confinement 
is, is work on, on your local environments in terms of making that more highly attractive and, and more biodiversity friendly. Um, sustainable and, and choice uh, are also very important in a number of us. And I think this is not about giving a lesson to anybody and telling anybody what they can do or cannot do and what's their culture. In my countries, there are, there are people with culture deeply ingrained in, in eating meat uh, and their system is actually adapted to that. And uh, it's not my place to, to tell the people in the North that they should not be eating meat. But what I think is we should all make a responsible choice and be aware of those choice and, and, and provide that information. And it is, I think it is not about make rules and making things not available or, or, or forcing people to do things. It's about encouraging people to do it it's the nudge uh, factor and how we make people making different choice. It's very interesting to see that during the COVID period, there is a decrease in the consumption of animal protein and an increase in the consumption of flour and all those baking. So people naturally are moving to that. And, and we have to understand that and encourage that and make that uh, stick for the after uh, uh, COVID period. So. I, I am looking at the current crisis as a very serious and sad event, but also as a giant laboratory of a different way of life. And, and in, in, for some of us, uh, there is some aspects that are very good. We don't need to, to uh, crowd in urban transit to get to an office and crowd again at night. We can work from home. So look at that and look at all those choices you make every day and, and uh, work with them. Next slide. Help us help you and, and how that's how all the piece are brought back together. Uh, I'm sure you've noticed that uh, uh, we've put all those various pieces through the deck and then now they're coming back as a jigsaw puzzle. Um, empowering people and I think that's a lot of what you're doing through GYBN and, and, and I think you're, you're giving a voice to those youth groups across the world and the more you can increase the colors on that map that Christian shows us in the beginning, the better. Um, what does investing in use mean to you? So how much are you investing in yourself, in your group, and how much others are investing? So that's, that's another imp important. Making the bridge into intergenerational, intercultural understanding, I think we got a lot to learn, and, and I think we got a lot to, uh, to do in terms of creating those links and making sure that uh, the voice are heard. And, and perhaps it is also in, you know, you have a very strong voice and you, you've been very, you know, you've been actually very successful uh, in getting your message across. What I think you need to keep in mind is how your message are influencing the positions of parties. So what is the content of the message? It is great to push in people forward, but within that push, you need to have a lot of useful and important elements that they can readily accept. Convincing people and changing behaviors to a greener life. I think uh, I don't need to say more than that. I've, I've, I think I've repeated that three or four times, but you have a unique place to do those kind of under the radar kind of social changes. Um, clearly, uh, some of us like Francis and I have children's mind are pretty older, but I'm at the point in my life when, when my children are telling me something is done, I look pretty sad, so I change. So that's, uh, that's something we, we, we listen to. So uh, next slide, and I think I'm getting toward the end here. Um, here is the end of our presentation. I'm looking forward to the, uh, to the chat box. I have not looked at it in the last few minutes, but uh, everything's gonna be all right, as they say in Italian here. And, and I think we gotta, we gotta keep up that momentum of working together. And, uh, and working with people. So looking forward to the question and uh, back to you, I think, Christian. Thank you so much, Francis and Basile. Um, I'm so happy to see that you still preserved a lot of the energy that I saw in your faces when we were in Rome um, almost three months ago. So that's very good. Thank you for all the motivating words that you shared with us. I was very happy when I read the line, use are an essential actor. So I think this is something that we definitely agree with. You also talked about intergenerational equity. So I'm really happy that this was all mentioned. Um, we will now go over to the question and answer session. 
uh, before we go into the live part, we have received a lot of questions through the Google form that we send around. Thank you so much to everybody uh, that sent us questions. And we will start with these questions. And right after this, we will open up the floor. Um, and then all of you who are here can um, ask your questions to the co-chairs. We already saw that a lot of people submitted comments um, and also some questions. So please be a bit patient. We'll get to them in a few moments. Um, but let's start with the questions that we had received before. Um, Thomas, I hand over to you now. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I just want to kind of reiterate what uh, Christian said. So just thank you to everyone who sent in uh, questions. We received a lot of questions. Um, we tried to uh, group similar questions together. So you might see that wording uh, might have changed a little bit, but it was just so that we could kind of uh, encompass the most amount of questions as possible. Um, so we'll kind of uh, move along to the first question there that uh, we have prepared. Um, so this one was from, uh, and I apologize if I pronounce names wrong. Um, this was from uh, Bijay Bashal, uh, and his question, or and their question was, um, as the post-2020 bio global biodiversity framework is created, what differences are we facing in terms of drivers of biodiversity loss, pressures, and other factors compared to 2010 when the previous strategy was created? Um, so I believe this question is is more along the lines of um, at the kind of global stage, um, what sort of differences are we seeing now compared to uh, you know the previous the previous strategy? How has that landscape changed? And Thomas, before we jump into that question, um, I forgot we also have Jyoti from the CBD Secretariat here. Jyoti, if you would also like to respond to any of the questions, feel free to just unmute yourself. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So Francis, maybe I'll start to see a few words and, and then you can, as usual, uh, correct me after that. Um, my sense is that the, the, the drivers of biodiversity loss has not changed that much over the 10 year period. They have been kind of growing over time. What has changed is, is now we have the IPES assessments that provide us with a lot more clarity on what they are and then give us a frame to, uh, to shape our action. What has changed also is uh, the reaction of parties to this, the convention. They have asked us very clearly to give us a, a clear depiction on how the action we propose they take will help solve those problems. So it's not about shooting in the dark and hoping it's gonna get there. It is, it is about, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do uh, protection and conservation of this. I'm going to do reduction in the use of this. How does that ensure that I'm going to get to the goal? And, and that's how I think it, that's one of the big difference. Francis. Thank you, Basil. Uh, I, you always make fun that I love to correct. I, I want to compliment you. Um, exactly what you have said is correct. Um, I think what else are we seeing perhaps different um, as Basil has said, perhaps these levels have remained more or less as they were. It is done the intensity of them becoming much more. Take, for example, if it is uh, expansion of area for agriculture, you will see more of that happening because of increasing human population globally. So definitely the, the, the pressures are just increasing in scope, I mean, or in magnitude as the years go by because human population is not going down. So that is the major thing I would say there. But also, I think this period, we are seeing a lot of uh, emphasis being put on taking into account climate change as contributing to biodiversity loss. Maybe that is something that uh, at the time we are adopting the um, current framework or the current strategy, it might have not been as strong as now, but you can see now people really are thinking that but then the other also is on the SDGs that we see people really want us to bring out very clearly um, that as a new lens to seeing that biodiversity becomes more relevant to policy makers, to decision makers, because the loss of biodiversity then achievement of the SDGs could be compromised. So th those could be the other and others. I mean, some other new things that have come when we look now at the post-2020. But largely, the drivers have remained really the same. The dollar and the pressure is not increasing in magnitude. 
Um, may I just add one thing in this? I think one of the biggest um, uh, changes that we face right now is that um, that uh, political pressure is changing also now. So the biodiversity loss and the pressures remain the same, but but there is a high level of um, of uh, spotlight on biodiversity loss now. Parties have fully engaged in this uh, process now and understand that we need to do something. And uh, I think the youth can be a really good part of that movement by creating, you know, um, um, uh, linking with their national uh, focal points and uh, the biodiversity focal points, et cetera. So I think that would be uh, also key to um, this challenge. Uh, um, something I, I forgot to point out, another new dimension we are seeing is that even right now, uh, there is now very much recognition of, and I've seen it happening a lot in Uganda here, people are beginning to link actually disasters to loss of ecosystems and others. So this is something maybe people are taking for granted, but if you are following the news in Uganda now, we are having landslides, we are having floods, and most of this is where people have degraded the environment, where they have settled in fragile ecosystems. So people are beginning to see the need to actually protect nature, to be better uh, in terms of just, uh, sustainability of livelihoods and even security of life itself. So these pandemics and disasters is opening the eyes of people that being reckless to nature is not going to be the way to go in the years to come. Um, fantastic. Thank you all for your responses. I, uh, I think it's I think it's very interesting to kind of point out that a lot of those while a lot of those drivers are the same, um, you know, the, the kind of uh, other factors are changed, and especially that linkage between um, kind of climate change and that will to include youth um, uh, increasing, um, as well as that kind of like global look at biodiversity. Um, so thank you for those answers. Um, the next question I have here uh, was submitted by uh, Julian Lowe from Denmark. Um, and I believe in the chat there was a similar question um, that was submitted by uh, Jessica. Um, so the question is, uh, why do you think that most of the Aichi targets weren't successfully met? And how can we ensure that the next set of targets are stronger based on science and achievable while still remaining robust? So kind of uh, what sort of lessons learned are there and um, how are we ensuring that, um, you know, this next uh, step in global biodiversity protection um, is going to be uh, stronger than uh, those previous targets. So maybe I, I could start. Um, first, uh, it's important to keep in mind that uh, if uh, the actual letter of the targets may not have been reached, there has been a lot of good work being done over the last 10 years. So it's not like nothing happened or it was a, a, a total disaster. Uh, what we learn and what countries have told us is, is uh, they want to have realistic, achievable targets. They want to have measurable targets that, can, that are smart. And, and also, they've asked us also to look into making sure that there is a much more robust uh, uh, transparency and responsibility system. And what does that mean? That means one where the plans that are provided the, the, the evolution of the NBSAP system is, is one where um, countries are, are able to see, and there is a transparency element, how each other are making the progress. So perhaps uh, some plans with, which are much more comprehensive in terms of addressing all the relevant targets and, and that, are, that are available according to a schedule that parties will agree to. So, uh, the second element is around the reporting elements. And again, uh, it, is, it is essential that we get to a system where, where we globally uh, get uh, the elements in time. And, and that turns us into the third element, which is around review. And elements of the review system is going to be performed by the secretariat, which is what an, an organization like IPES, which is around the global stock take and how we're going to be assembling the objective part of those reports into a, a, a tracking system that enable us to know whether we're making progress toward those targets. 
But there is also kind of the learning elements and uh, the more subjective part of the review mechanism. And, and we're going to be testing some interesting ways of doing things and where parties will be presenting to peers how they're doing. And then finally, there is the classic uh, peer review system with one country. So basically, I think the, the elements of, of having achievable, they're not aspirational, they're real targets that according to the parties, we can achieve. And then having strong mechanism and enable to, uh, to, uh, uh, to see where we are. This is about learning about what has not worked in the previous cycle, but also what has worked. And, and we know that uh, having simple targets like 17 and 10 was something that captured the imagination and uh, the attention of politicians and, and made for really good accountability. Francis. Thank you, Basil. Just to add a few points here. Um, what could have also contributed to the IT targets not being successfully met where some were really process issues. For example, the review and updating of the NBSAPs because the parties had to do that after the strategic plan was adopted so that they can begin to implement the, 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 the targets, the global targets. But that process alone took five years. Other parties even by the time we are beginning to work in, in, in COP is adopting a decision to, to, to begin post 2020, other parties were still on this process. So really that was a big, big uh, stumbling block. And I think this time around we need to be looking at how if we, the, the NBSAPs are going to be aligned, that it doesn't take all that time. And then it consumes a lot of time. Because if you take five years, six years, just to review and update, what time do you have to implement? The other was on resources for implementation. Again, that is something that didn't come as anticipated or as expected. A lot of discussions are happening on targets the doubling of the double and uh, so many things happened around that. And then the other is on capacity building. Really, at the time when the framework is adopted, then you find there was discussion on the capacity needed to implement that strategy. And that kept going on as well. It kept going on in corps after COP. And this time around, there is already effort now to make sure we have the strategy capacity building strategy in place in advance, in, in concurrently with this, so that we are not adopting and then saying now develop the strategy for capacity building. So this is why most of the things, even resource mobilization, they're happening concurrently to try to, to, to bridge the other gap of, as I said, uh, is in reporting, the cost of reporting, especially for the LVCs, Look here, the LDCs are given $20,000 for a long time to ripple us how much can you do possible with that. That means people have to rely on data that was already there. But again, with a framework like that, there should be a system in place for really countries to systematically keep collecting data. So by the time you are thinking of collect, going to institution to get data, even that data might be very old data. So this time around things have to be done a little bit different if you are going to see um, a better reporting in the post 2020. I think those are just a few to add on what my. May, may I just add one very essential part of this new framework is that it's a very participatory and open process this time. And we have had IPLC, civil society, business, everybody being part of this. And uh, hopefully this will uh, ensure that the targets will be much stronger and achievable uh, in the future. Thanks. Excellent. Um, thank you for, for all those answers. I think that's um, uh, very kind of uh, nice to know that the, uh, like kind of, you know, looking at those previous targets, um, there were, you know, some, some successes that we can build off of, but also kind of lessons learned in terms of, you know, making sure that the next set of goals and, and, and targets are, um, you know, realistic and measurable. Um, and there is a bit more of that transparency uh, around um, kind of reporting. Um, and then also kind of indicating, and I might jump ahead a few questions here, so I apologize, uh, Grecia, um, but kind of indicating around those, uh, some of those process issues. 
um, in terms of, you know, it takes five years for, for an MPSAP to get created, or it takes time for these to be implemented at the national level. Um, and kind of, you know, mentioning uh, that kind of capacity building strategy um, and kind of increasing um, reporting. So I was kind of hoping to jump ahead a few questions because there was one that kind of feeds into this. Um, and it was from uh, Vijay uh, Bashel from Nepal. Um, and it was, how can we ensure our countries deliver on the strong uh, COP decisions that they signed on to? And how can we ensure that MPSAPs are created promptly and accurately reflect um, COP decisions? So I know uh, that this was, uh, Francis, you touched on this a little bit, um, but I was wondering if we might, if um, there were any kind of like concrete kind of plans and strategies, is it around that capacity building strategy? Um, but I was wondering um, if there were kind of uh, a bit expanding on those discussions uh, around um, how we can make sure that MBSAPs are prompt um, and that we're able to deliver on those strong pop decisions at the national level. So um, I won't I won't repeat what I said about the the system and accountability, but I think uh, uh, one element of of answer to that question is the way to know who's doing what and how pro how progress are, are made. But I think you you, you um, uh, Thomas you, you point to an important point which is around capacity and resources, and definitely uh, we heard very clearly that we can have the best plan in the world, perfect plans everybody work together. If we don't put resources on the table and we don't make resource available for people to implement at them, that's just a paper or uh, a document that rests on the web somewhere. So so lots of discussion about resource mobilization and, and clearly uh, that's gonna be a very important aspect. Uh, the ground is shifting under us as we, as we work. Uh, we had a, a workshop in Berlin with very, very good work and it was very encouraging. But since then, the COVID crisis and, and this kind of unprecedented draw on, on public finance is, is changing the game. Um, I think we, we, it is not to say that we're negative about it. I think it's changing the way we're making decisions and the speed at which we, we need to make those decisions. So if we're not fast in providing advice to government on how they should rebuild and we wait until uh, 2021, it's going to be way too late. Like the, the train would have left the station and we will be standing on the platform with our hands empty. So this is about both working over the short term, providing advice to government, but also working for the long term in terms of how we're going to be shaping the resource mobilization. I was hearing a little bit earlier this morning, Egypt Minister Yasmin Fouad talking about the capacity building and how the people aspect of this is important, making sure, and then Francis has been talking about that uh, many, many times and impressing on me that is, it is about uh, going to developed countries and, and providing some capacity, but it's also about leaving some capacity there, training people and making sure people are able to pick it up and, and move the file forward. So uh, definitely those are messages that stick with me. So the addition to the the transparency and responsibility part is, is resource mobilization and capacity building. Francis? Yes, um, if I got um, uh, the, the, the question right or the comments right, thank you so much for what you've said, uh, Co-Chair. I'll just want to add a few things, might build more on what you have said as well, that um, actually this framework, its in implementation will be at the national level, of course, up to sub-national level. So we will take action at the global level to have the framework in place, but where the action is going to occur will be at, at, at country level. So even when you're looking at the matters of capacity building, and I'm glad uh, that my co has reminded me about this, we should be adding the element of capacity development as well. Because you see capacity building usually it's like a program that keeps going on and on. If you're targeting, targeting training, say, focal points, you've trained them. They know how to do ecosystem assessment and so forth. Focal points only, they're 196 plus, they know. But time comes when they leave. So what has happened as they leave? You may find that we don't have capacity yet at the national level. So when you're talking about um, capacity development here now, you're looking at maybe creating centers of excellence, having some 
um, institutional capacities enhanced better than they are, than just focusing on individuals. Training, calling me to go and attend a meeting, um, CT this on that is okay, but one individual alone cannot help us a lot sometimes when it comes to this element of people leaving work or you know retiring and don't know how they are translating that before they leave. And of course, other things even like on resource mobilization, still that touches down where the action is going to be. These resources, how best are they going to be uh, made available to countries or how countries are going to do that? So these, these things, national level action is very important as well. In fact, it would be the key to everything. Perfect. Um, thank you both for uh, kind of expanding on, on that answer. Uh, fantastic. Um, so the, the next question, and I think Jody, you touched on this a little bit, um, was from Mohammed Manjur Hassan from Bangladesh. And it was, how can we ensure that indigenous peoples and local communities will be engaged within the post 2020 global biodiversity framework? Um, and uh, Jody, you had mentioned um, kind of those open sessions as we work in those, uh, in those working groups. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, kind of expanding on that a little bit, um, how can we ensure the, that continued um, involvement? How can we ensure that, because um, we, when we talk about as before in terms of capacity and resources, um, how can we continue to ensure that um, Indigenous people and local communities do have those resources and those, uh, that capacity to continue their involvement um, within this global biodiversity framework um, and you know, beyond 2020 as we adopt a new strategy? Uh, is that to me or to the co-chairs or to all three of us? Um, this one, I, I believe, is, it would be all three. Um, I'd love to hear. OK, so maybe I could start with, a, with um, the process that is already ongoing within uh, the CBD. As some of you may know, we have a working group on um, 8J, Article 8J, which is about uh, indigenous peoples and local communities. We are the only multilateral uh, environmental agreement that actually has space for, uh, um, for, uh, for IPLCs to um, contribute to the discussions of the, uh, of the COP. Uh, we had a meeting of the uh, of the of this group, uh, Article 8J uh, working group last year at the margins of SUPSTA before SUPSTA uh, 23. Uh, the report of this is going to go to um, uh, to the uh, to our upcoming SBI session, and after that, we will hope that there will be decisions made on how. Uh, IPLCs can con continue to be part of the negotiations and political process. However, I think that in the post-2020 framework, and I will let the uh, co-chair speak a little bit more about this, uh, there will be, um, there will be um, places uh, where IPLCs will be hugely encouraged to actually work with their government or on their own with their communities to try and implement um, whatever uh, is negotiate, negotiated and adopted at COP15. So I will leave it to the co-chairs to take it from there about the post-2020. So, so um, thank you, Jyoti. And, and I think you set the, stand, the, the scene right. If we look at uh, the kind of change and the kind of world we're looking for and what we need to reverse that decline in biodiversity, uh, there is no doubt in, in our mind that that cannot be done without indigenous people and local communities. So that's, that's start from there. You know, if they're not there, it's not gonna happen. So, so the question is how and, and, and at what level, et cetera. Um, many countries are, are, are di very different approaches, uh, their structures, uh, et cetera, and we have to be respectful of that if we want to be successful. So what we're trying to find is, is the right happy middle where, where we get the right language in, term, in the framework in terms of enabling that action to, be, to, to take place. And then <clears throat> uh, ensure through the photo web, through the, the what will, what, what, the uh, working group on AJ and whatever successor to that group will be, 
are enabled to to take that that uh, that tools and and that incentive and transform that into actual action on the ground. So, uh, in our views, it is absolutely essential that the indigenous people and local community be part of the drafting of the framework. Uh, nothing. Uh, that's a saying we use in Canada and, and about indigenous people is nothing is about us without us and, and that apply a little bit here, which is about engaging indigenous people in the discussion about the targets and then making sure that the language we have is one that works for the various uh, local circumstances, enable people uh, to work. So that's all for me. Uh, Francis, you want to add anything? I think very little I'm going to add here that um, I think even in the post 2020 process itself, we have as co-chairs continuously engaged uh, the IPLCs, sometimes even when we are at the, uh, the open group meetings, the request for meetings to, to meet us, we've met them severally. We met them, I think, when we had the informal uh, meeting in um, November, uh, last year when we were doing the informal briefing. And I think we specifically had a session for them. So we've always given them audience. We've always, you know, made sure that when they request, we are there to listen to them and, uh, you know, take their views on board. Because when you look at biodiversity and you look at issues of local communities, the linkage is so clear. You are having local communities who constitute perhaps the biggest population in worldwide. If you talk about uh, the I the, the the IPLCs in that regard. So you have a bigger constituency that are much more in contact with the biodiversity almost on a daily basis. Almost, maybe in fact, every, every day they are in contact with the biodiversity. And if you look at the IPBS report, it was so interesting that areas that are under IPLCs are actually were experiencing less uh, loss, if not even no loss at all, than these other areas. So where you have areas where the IPLCs are, are those areas who are not under threat. So this uh, constituency or the IPLCs are a very important um, stakeholder for the post-2020. But as Jyoti has said, even the convention itself has a provision that really takes into account the importance of IPLCs. So this convention really takes uh, the IPLC issues very seriously and as co-chairs, we made sure that we keep that moving forward. Uh, perfect, thank you so much. Um, so on to the uh, next question, and uh, I believe there was a, 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 remember the image, uh, there was a question too around uh, kind of technology and sciences. Um, so this question comes from uh, Rodrigo Arias from Paraguay, uh, and the question is within the context of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework, how will advances in biotechnology be regulated and controlled to prevent them from being harmful to human health and the environment? Um, so I believe this is kind of in reference to, um, as we've seen uh, lately at uh, the inter uh, meetings and at the most recent talk, um, that kind of uh, growing question around biotechnology um, and around uh, kind of those impacts on human health. Um, so I believe, yeah, that is kind of related to that and how can we ensure um, human and environmental health as uh, biotechnologies kind of increase in popularity. Francis, maybe you start on this one. Uh, Co chair, uh, thanks. I think the, the, the issue of uh, biotechnology uh, versus uh, conservation of biodiversity has always been generating a lot of you know debate whenever it comes up. And again, of course, it is coming up in the post 2020 uh, as well. So it, it has never like become anything that doesn't attract a lot of debates or a lot of attention. But looking at the post 2020, how will it be done differently? Uh, how will it be regulated? First, I think we are having opportunity to hear feedback from parties on how they want this handled. We have, of course, a number of processes that happens. One, and the judge will correct me on this one if I may be wrong, but um, I think we, we have a liaison group um, that is composed of a number of, uh, you know, the, the expertise that are there is well balanced. Then we have got 
the risk assessment as well being um, debated. I think we have even, a, there was a, a request to have um, nominations for this. So there are various levels of discussion that is happening. And through that process, we get feedback as co-chairs to help us to see that the views coming from those processes are then articulated, articulated into the post-2020. So we have got ongoing experts meeting, ad hoc experts working group meeting on the Cartagena protocol. We have got one that's with the compliance committee on the Cartagena protocol. So there are a number of processes that is happening and the issues of trying to balance biotechnology with the conservation is of course coming up in those discussions. I know that there is a lot of um, debate on whether biotechnology can exist with uh, conservation. Most people think perhaps uh, the two uh, seem to be far apart, but I can also say that I think with the te biotechnology, some of the benefits are there and is clear. So we need to look at those benefits from biotechnology that would not compromise um, conservation, but rather help us to do conservation work better. And those are the kind of technologies that I think in the post 2020 um, will be coming up. We may not really say we can't do away or we can do away with uh, biotechnology because that might itself also bring another uh, call it process of moving very, very many steps backwards. There are benefits definitely that comes out of biotechnology, but we need to understand them um, as we move in the post 2020. But something I need to say before I forget is that we need to build capacity of LDCs, especially to really do monitoring, to be able to answer questions that come from biotechnology. Because if that capacity is lacking, especially for the least developed countries, then it will mean when questions come, they are not able to answer. When they are needed to take action, they're not able to, to do it effectively. So capacity building, as we've been talking earlier in the, in the beginning, even on biotechnology, is going to be very, very important in the post-2020. Countries must more or less be at the same level to be able to respond to any queries, to any concerns that would arise out of biotechnology. Because with the biotech, the biggest thing is the fear. What drives people most about biotechnology is the fear that this is a GMO, this is what, how is it going to affect me, this. So people pose so many questions. So the capacity of these LDCs to respond to that in the post-2020, or all, kind, all, all parties, all countries to respond to that is going to be very important so that we can try our best to allay fears. And also, of course, monitoring the impact of biotechnology it will also be important as we you know, go towards uh, the post-2020 process. So we need to be able to do that. If we're going to monitor any interventions by, from biotechnology to help us to really inform and allay fears. But the way monitoring is not being done, and maybe it's compounded by lack of capacity, then the fears will keep building. And so biotechnology will remain a concern like that to most people. You go chair, you may want to add something. No, Fra Francis, I think you, you, you very, very briefly, uh, you will continue to see uh, targets around those issues in, in the framework. And, and actually, what I, I would I just want to point you to is, is in a few weeks, you're going to see some document published for Substar. And those documents are not trying to look at the new language of the target per se, but they're looking at the element and the monitoring, uh, the potential uh, for monitoring indicators related to all, and in particular with that. So have a look at that. And, and even when, when you look at the targets and you don't see specific language, that you're looking for, go look at the elements, go look at the performance indicators because the level of detail sometimes is there and that may be uh, providing you with what you're looking for. Thank you. Could, could I just ask three more processes? One is that we have um, a separate consultation ongoing and a policy uh, and a decision that will be made by uh, the Cartagena protocol on um, on post-2020. Um, we also have a separate um, uh, 
uh, discussion ongoing on DSI, uh, digital sequence information, as well as on synthetic, um, tech, uh, synthetic biotechnology. So all of that will, uh, these, uh, these are discussions that are ongoing and some of them will come back to uh, the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework at its third meeting and some will go directly to COP. So I think there are many, many processes ongoing to safeguard um, um, human health and environment. Thanks. Um, perfect. For, for the answers to that question. Um, definitely not an easy one, so uh, I appreciate um, everyone, um, you know, giving you know, those, those different options and uh, answers there. Um, I, I do realize we are getting uh, right at 11.30, very close. Um, I'm hoping that we're still able to get through a few more questions, um, just as we did have a, a bunch of questions in the chat and some um, still left over that were, were sent in. Um, so I'm hoping maybe we can kind of get through a few uh, maybe a bit rapidly, just to, just because we do have a, a, a privileged opportunity here, and I think a lot of people are very excited to get to to um, speak with the co-chair and get some uh, questions answered. Um, so what I'm going to kind of jump to next, um, as I saw, uh, we have a few questions submitted around um, the pandemic. Uh, there, I think I saw one or two in the Q and A within this chat as well. Um, and so, and I know you briefly touched on it. Um, so kind of wrapping them all together, we've kind of got a question here from uh, Rachel R. Uh, Rescordado from the Philippines. Um, so with new pandemics arising, how would the post-2020 global biodiversity framework help to ensure that such diseases will be prevented in the future in terms of global policy, youth involvement, and indigenous people's role? And this, how much has the current uh, pandemic changed um, the, the post 2020 process in terms of targets? Would there be kind of a larger emphasis on human health and the connection between biodiversity and human health? Um, and uh, yeah, so as we kind of look at the, the construction of the framework, um, are there kind of uh, targets or language that are being changed and affected by the current pandemic? Before, before we start our response, I know Jyoti has to leave so if that's okay with you, we should probably let her say a few words and then after that, we'll come back and, and, and pick up the question. Is that okay? Thank you, Jyoti. I know you uh, are, are sticking on a little, uh, already running a little late, so I appreciate, uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'm sorry we have so many events today, uh, and which is great. And my next event is also a youth event. So we are so pleased and thrilled that the youth are taking this on themselves. Um, as you have heard all along from the co-chairs, from Elizabeth, we, we, are, we are all going to be retired or old uh, and you know, sitting in our gardens by the time 2050 comes along. So we are, we are hoping to pass this baton on to you very soon. Uh, I'm the director for implementation. And so for me, it's extremely important that you uh, the youth are able to uh, take this 30-year framework and make something out of it, and that maybe by 2050 we will really be living in harmony with nature. That we would have uh, we would have um, you know reached all those SDGs. We have gone beyond that. We will be in. Um, we will have achieved all the uh, 2030 uh, 2050 goals, and you will correct the mistakes that we in our generation have made. Uh, I really hope that that will, that will happen because as Elizabeth said, um, youth suffer the most from biodiversity loss and we uh, hope that this will help in some way um, mitigate what, what has happened so far. As we've seen in, this, um, in, this 20, uh, in 2020, we have been at home for three months nearly and nature regenerates. We have seen so many beautiful pictures of nature um, taking the space that we, uh, we humans have vacated. I mean, in my country in India, and there must be some people uh, from India on this chat, I uh, on this webinar, I hope 
there are so many fantastic stories coming out, dolphins in, uh, in places that have never been seen, elephants. Um, you can see um, the Himalayas from cities where for 30 years people had forgotten that you could actually see them in the past. So I'm so happy that, um, uh, that we've had a chance to see what nature can do. Not happy about the pandemic, but we know that we can, uh, that maybe if we build back better, if we do things differently from this crisis and learn from this crisis, there are really good uh, opportunities. And Gibbon is a family. Gibbon is the family um, around the world. You guys meet very rarely, but you continue your commitment. So we are, and we are so proud to be associated with you at the CBD Secretariat. We're all in this together, and I hope we can uh, we can get where we want to go. Thank you so much. Amazing, well said, and thank you, Jody, for for you know giving us some time today and joining us. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. So now back to uh, back to. Uh, uh, health. So what science is telling us very clearly is the link between uh, uh, human health and, and pandemics and, and uh, nature revolve around land use change, contact and, and contact between human and, and wildlife. So there is many other variables that influence pandemics such as outside of biodiversity, such as uh, growth in population, increased travel, but mainly those not easy to tackle with. It's a lot easier to deal with the uh, land use part, the biodiversity one. So we're getting a lot of interest from the health people talking to us and saying, how can we work together? And then the, the uh, notion of changing land use is, is relatively complex and, and things that are emerging, it is not only about uh, the availability of uh, a space for for species to uh, have healthy life, but it's also the stress and how, what kind of uh, life story they, they can have. The more stressed a species has because of noise, because of contact with human, the easier they're gonna, they're gonna be able to shed some pathogen from their species to another species. So uh, that is, we're well, looking forward to the, the IPDES reports. There is a number of countries that are shared with, uh, uh, with us uh, their own studies, and, and I think that the science is going to be relatively clear. Now we're getting to the point of the action. And as mentioned uh, earlier, there is probably two phases that are relevant to us. There is the relatively short phase, providing advice to government on what they're going to do in spending those vast amount of money on economic restart. So are they going to go one way, rebuilding roads and bridge, and destroying more of biodiversity? Are they going to go the other way, investing in restoration and in creating jobs for people of its place, but also making good for the environment? So we have to provide very quickly those incentives and that package of information to make sure people are aware of the choice they're making. And that's the, the, the relatively short-term one. The longer-term one is how do we reflect health in the framework? And that's how we come to the engagement of local communities, uh, indigenous people and youth. And um, in a sense, if you look at uh, draft zero, you'll see how it's mentioned several times. And what we heard in, in Rome, which was kind of before the crisis in a sense, is people were, were happy with that. So we were not asked to remove those things. I think we're gonna have some more conversation. There is a, a big discussion happening on health at uh, SEPSTA. And, and we're going to have a, a round of, uh, of uh, webinar with parties and we're going to ask them how they, they see the health question shape. And, and I think we get enough of a mandate to make sure that we, we draw the links between the existing piece. So it is not about turning around the framework. It is more about making the links and ensuring people understand the, uh, the perspective of health. Francis? Um. Thank you. I think I'll just add something a little because you have almost said it all. Um, I think this question really is, is, is clearly shows that I think we are all seeing that um, the post this pandemic has really raised the bar for the post-2020. And um, those of you who could have participated in um, COP11, 
I think it was it was in um, India in Hyderabad. Now that for oh, the theme was nature protects if she's protected. If you check on uh, on a book which they have produced the outcomes of that meeting, that is how it is. Nature protects if she's protected. So meaning, if we are going to be protected from pandemics by nature, first we have to do our part. We cannot continue to degrade, continue to lead to loss of biodiversity and expect nature to protect us. Having said that, as co-chairs and as you will be seeing in the next version of the documents that will be coming out, we, you'll be seeing a lot of linkage to health on our biodiversity and health is, is, is taking a very important role in our drafting. And I think that is something that you, the stakeholders, are going to see pandemics. We're still going to come from biodiversity. So that means we can not have a choice now to take biodiversity for granted. And of course, the IPLCs, the youth, the IPLCs, they have a lot of information about how they have maybe uh, treated certain pandemics when it has come and how still during the post-2020 process, uh, the global community or the world can continue to benefit from that. Because IPLCs for most of the time, pandemics come, may not be global in nature, some of them within themselves, they are well aware they are, but they have always been able to handle that. Now that is knowledge, which is based on biodiversity, it is based on how they have used that, that, that biodiversity that they have to answer or to mitigate um, some of the pandemic that has come. And the youth themselves from, from the IPLC with the parents who are IPLCs, you expect those are the, again the future, uh, you know, leaders who are going to or IPLCs are going to pass on the knowledge. So the IPLCs and the youth are so linked and so important when we are talking about looking at pandemics and how biodiversity is going to help us address that, especially diseases and so forth. So all these uh, groups have got a big role to play. And of course, then government has to put in place the necessary policies that would enable uh, that kind of intervention to take place. All right, perfect. Thank you both for, um, for those answers. Uh, but do you like see that you have to leave now for a call? So um, I just want to thank you, Merci beaucoup, for your time today. Um, you as well, Francis, I'm glad that you were both able to um, take some time on, I'm sure, your busy schedules, especially on uh, International Day for Biodiversity to uh, talk with us and answer some questions. So um, thank you so much. Um, Francis, I don't know if you have time, if I uh, ask you one more question from chat, um, but I totally understand if uh, your time is limited today. Hello? Uh, are you, do you have time for one more question before? Uh... No, it, it's okay. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Um, so I, I was gonna, um, kind of pull together a few questions from chat, um, as well as uh, some of the questions that we received previously. Um, so we did have a lot of questions around kind of youth involvement in post 2020 and kind of inflammation on the ground in, uh, in their community. Um, within your presentation, I think um, uh, there was a, a really uh, nice graphic there where you laid out kind of uh, how youth can be involved and in, in the unique role that uh, young people are able to play. Um, so kind of pulling these questions together, I think there's a um, question around um, if there's a role that uh, within the framework or from the CBD that can be played um, to increase uh, kind of youth support um, kind of beyond a volunteer way that um, the, the CBD can advocate or um, within the, the post framework itself can push for uh, greater youth um, empowerment and kind of elevation, um, keeping in mind kind of, you know, for a lot of young people around the world, there are some sort of, there are limitations around kind of capacity and resources. So um, I think uh, to kind of summarize and bring it all together, is there, is there a role that we can see or is there a part that can be played in the post-2020 process in terms of DVD to help with youth empowerment kind of beyond that volunteer um, position? Thank you.
Um, Thomas, you're muted. Sorry, uh, I don't know if Francis we can hear you. Yeah. Or, uh... His camera is also gone. Francis, are you with us? I think he went offline. I know he's here. Yeah. I actually he, I didn't hear much uh, what he was asking. He was still trying to explain, so I don't know what the question was. Oh, I apologize. Um, so I was uh, kind of wondering if, um, as we look at the kind of the strategy in that post twenty twenty framework, um, mm -hmm. if there is a way to, um, in kind of like uh, writing, or if there's a firm way to help empower youth so that they can be engaged. Um, in ways potentially beyond uh, volunteering. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's kind of like is there a way within the post twenty twenty strategy to give youth a platform that's a bit stronger than kind of volunteering? Uh, uh, thank you. I hope I'll be able to answer that question. Um, first, of course, um, even in in the targets you 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 saw in the zero draft itself, uh, there is one of the targets that was covering the youth itself and i think we we we've still made sure that we keep reflecting that so it the, the youth this time around may not be um, I think um, going forward, the youth themselves, I think we we need to try our best to see that they're engaged, especially at the national level, where the actions take place. We need to be making sure that the youth involvement is much more give, is given a, a much more prominent role at the national level. Because as I said earlier, implementation of the framework will be at the national level. So if we could have youth getting more engaged on biodiversity at national level, then that is one way of making sure that they are, you know, giving, giving a much more active role. I'll tell you that um, here in Uganda, I can give an example that when you have got an activity going on, say, for example, restoration work, and we, the youth come on board, you realize that you do quite, you know, substantial work in a very short time. Most of them, uh, they have the energy, they are ready to work. So I think designing youth programs within the biodiversity conservation uh, in the post-2020, especially at national level, would be one way to make sure that youth are delivered taken on board and they become active part partners or participants in the implementation of the post-2020 national level. So we have to think of how we engage them more at the national level. Because I think at the global level, there is a lot of effort already taking place. But at the national level, that is where programs on youth involvement, on biodiversity or implementation of the framework needs to be better grounded. That's how I would try to respond to your question. Perfect. OK, thank you so much um, for the answer and for um, being able to you know, join us today and answer all of those questions. Um, I know the, the call today, the, the Q&A session has gone a little late. So um, once again, like I sincerely, sincerely appreciate um, your, your time and being able to, to join us for longer than the uh, initial schedule. So um, thank you so much uh, from the entire team today. Thank you. And um, I'm going to kind of pass this along to uh, Simone. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas, for running this session. And hi, everyone. You're speaking to Smangile from uh, South Africa, who is part of the South African Youth Biodiversity Network and the Steering Committee for Gibbon. They've given me a very uh, light job, which is to give a brief summary of uh, the discussion that we had during Q&A. Um, so hopefully, if anyone had not joined in the beginning and you missed some parts, I'm happy to share with you um, a glimpse of what you missed out on. Um, so firstly, uh, I would love us to imagine one thing when we pick, when we keep on um, uh, advocating for youth to be involved. We are working towards the 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. It's currently 2020. In 30 years time, if you are 20 years right now, 
you yourself are going to be 50. And I'm saying this to emphasize the role of youth, not only to the older leaders who are here, but to ourselves, that as we grow up, may we always be informed of that, that we have a duty to keep on engaging those that are coming before us, because we're not going to be youth forever, and whoever is youth is going to be a leader um, of tomorrow. And um, the second thing I would love uh, to emphasize on that Francis uh, emphasized in the beginning was, while we have this pandemic, we still uh, do have a post-2020 global biodiversity framework to make, and just to assure us that as the coaches, they are still committed to it, equally parties are still uh, committed. Now, the first two of two sets of questions were more or less based on the 2010, 2011 to the 2020 framework, um, asking of how we are going to ensure that we do better uh, this time around. And um, in summary, the responses were in the lines of, you are very right, those targets are not fully met. But on the bright side, a lot of progress has been made from that time. Emphasis on the drivers of, of, of biodiversity lots have not changed, but we've learned a lot on why we did not achieve those targets. And one of the things they touched on was that uh, at this point, now we have IPBS, which is constantly providing factual, up-to-date scientific information that we need for decision-making. Another key point that was touched on was on resource mobilization, that at the last time we had the framework and only later on did we build on uh, the, the strategy for mobilizing resources. Whereas this time around, the discussion for mobilization strategy has already started and we are doing it concurrently into uh, doing uh, the framework um, um, itself. And of course, uh, emphasis on capacity building and other factors that were mentioned. And then we had a set of questions that were linked on how can we increase or improve the participation of our PLCs of youth and ensure that technology is taken into account. And just to summarize, firstly, there was a strong emphasis that there are already some processes within the CPD itself to ensure that there's participation um, um, of IPLCs and other groups. Um, so those who have had experience, you may have seen that you have uh, Article HJ in the convention. Uh, the coaches have been very much willing to meet with, uh, uh, in the same way they are meeting youth today for an online webinar. They've been availing themselves to meet uh, IPLCs as well. If you go to actual policy meetings, they've availed themselves to meet IPLCs for side meetings and other NGOs as well. But here there was just an emphasis that of course we still need more to build on, but there are processes within the convention and within this consultative process that everyone's views are being taken into account. And I know on the technical uh, question, uh, they, men they mentioned that there's ongoing expert group on risk assessments and a liaison group. And Francis actually emphasized that while these groups exist, the need to be more capacity built for the least developed countries in order to be able to engage effectively in these processes. Because it's one thing having the platform to speak, but not having the knowledge, the, 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 the enough required knowledge or capacity to actually make informed decisions uh, or contributions. And perhaps towards the last set of questions that we're looking forward into, now we had COVID-19, has it changed the scene uh, in any way? So it was clear in the beginning that it has definitely changed the timeline uh, of the meetings, number one. But secondly, that it has had some influence on the priorities for the content of the convention itself. This is the issue that was touched more recently on how there's been a lot of conduct from the health uh, uh, sector to say, how do we assist and engage? And of course, uh, we are expecting that there's gonna be more research pumped into uh, the convention to say, how do we link because uh, it's not a matter of changing everything into health, but there's already emphasis from parties and other uh, non-observer um, 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 uh, participants of the convention sending submissions on how we can link biodiversity uh, to health. And again, on my side, and this is something that I'm building on from the coaches that I love to really motivate young people on, discussion documents are going to be available online soon. One effective way for us to continue contributing in the process and keeping informed 
is to download the official documents, assist each other in understanding them and making written and oral submissions to the parties. And an emphasis that implementation of the convention happens at a national level. So while it's an international level, there's given that exists to chair such sessions, the chairs are willing to come online for implementation, the real the real power for implementation lies at a national level. So this is a call for everyone of you who's watching and who's here today to get in touch with your focal point for contributing as far as policy involved, for advocating for them to have a more youth exclusive process and to engineer your own projects and the ground and see how you can uh, mobilize support. So from my side, uh, that's a short uh, summary. I will give it uh, to you, uh, Priska, um, to close the session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Smangele. Um, and uh, yes, I'm Priska Daka uh, from Zimbabwe, and I'm with the Zimbabwe Youth uh, Biodiversity Network. Um, and I'd like to start off by uh, thanking um, the CBD uh, co-chairs, uh, Francis uh, Bazo and uh, Yoti for the presentations that they gave um, and also for answering um, all the questions um, that uh, young people had, uh, had, uh, had posted. Um, and we also want to appreciate uh, the message uh, sent to us by uh, the Acting Executive Secretary um, of the CBD, um, Elizabeth, um, which reminded us that we are connected uh, to biodiversity and that uh, nature-based uh, solutions um, should be uh, at the forefront. Um, our Thanks must also go to the committee, uh, the GYBN committee that uh, put this uh, meeting together um, and made it uh, uh, a success. And uh, finally, uh, on behalf of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, I would like to express my um, appreciation uh, to all the participants uh, for taking the time out to join us uh, today and um, for everybody who sent um, in their questions. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and I'd like to uh, close my remarks by saying that um, we as young people um, are agents, uh, are the primary agents of change and um, we must continue uh, giving uh, biodiversity um, a voice. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you so much uh, for your attention and thank you so much uh, for listening to us and uh, happy International uh, Biodiversity Day to everyone. Thank you. And over to you, Thomas. Thank you, everyone. I think um, we're gonna close now the session. So. I just wanted to, yeah, as well, just kind of say thank you to everyone. Um, Francis, thank you for staying on the call until the end. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything before we uh, ended the call, but um, I yeah. I think I can only say bye. The network is very poor and we really want to continue working with the youth uh, because a lot that is going to happen in the years to come, it will be the youth that actually to do that. So as co-chairs, we are ready to keep working with you and let's keep the discussion going. Thank you. Well said. Thank you so much. And happy biodiversity day. Happy biodiversity day. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We're really excited and we're very happy for all the great work. And let's continue celebrating the biodiversity day today. So take care and uh, yeah, uh, let's continue in our own places. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye. Stay Bye. tuned to our social media. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Happy Bye. Yeah.